In this video, we're going to take a look at the LP2 armor case for the Lati Panda Alpha. So I've got the Lati Panda Alpha single board computer I've had for a wee while. Did a review of this before, and I'm kind of wanting to start using it again. I, I had an idea for a project that I just never got around to doing with it, so it just sat in its box. But I've got the mini PC I've got behind my bedroom TV it just really isn't powerful enough, so I want to upgrade it. And I thought, well, this is sitting around anyway. I may as well use it for that. The problem is that it, because it's a single board computer, it's not got any sort of case, and therefore it's quite vulnerable to have sort of screwed to a wall behind a TV. So I wanted to buy a case for it. So there's a couple of different options. There's a plastic one that this just fits inside the existing cooling sol solution, or there's this armor case, which as you can see is a big aluminium heatsink. So you mount the Lati Panda inside this, removing the existing cooling solution, and you can either have it passively cooled, or you can mount a 40mm fan onto this. This retails for about 28 from Amazon, you can also buy it directly from DF Robots and a couple of other places. There's links in the description. So it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it should be quite nice. And I'm really interested to see what the thermal performance is like. First of all, with it running passively, and then with it running with a fan on this. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the case, we'll install it on the Lati Panda, and we'll do some tests and see how it affects the thermal performance. So that's the case there where you've got the two parts, with the screws in the bottom. We'll look at insulation later. And the rest of the accessories you get, you get some thermal paste, a little syringe. You get a 40mm fan, which is branded by ADA or ADDA, who I have heard of, so it's a, at least a branded fan. Be interesting to see how loud that is. Equally, it's just a standard 40mm fan with a two pin connector, so you could even fit like a Noctuan or something on this if you really wanted to. But we'll see how, first of all, how loud it is and then what the thermals are like. Because if this is a better heatsink than the built in one, even having the fan on it means the fan will probably run less often because the heatsink will work better passively but we'd really interested to see how well it works. Now the final thing you get is this little copper shim. So this is because the way this works it's got a bare die CPU and there's obviously a bit of a gap between the CPU and the heatsink and it'd also be really expensive to like mill out this to have it have a little section dropping down to sit on the CPU. So instead they provide a little copper shim that you put on top of the CPU. So you put the CPU, thermal paste, the shim, more thermal paste, then the case. So that'll sit in between. And we'll take a look at the whole installation process now. So what we'll do is we'll install it. So first thing we need to do is take the old solution off the Lappy Panda. So for that, I'll remove this drive. I've got an M.2 SSD in the back of it. I just had that in there for additional storage. Well, for primary storage, because it's faster than the EMMC. It's just 128 WD green. It's not fancy at all. Take that out like that, just because it's covering a screw. And you can see there's now these three screws that will remove the thermal solution, or four screws. So these four black screws off. I'll remove the original cooler. Cool, so that's all the screws removed. So in theory, we can now just disconnect the cable there for fan power, and this should just lift right off. Yep, there we go. So that's the cooler there with thermal paste, and then there's thermal paste on the CPU there. So I'll clean that thermal paste off and we'll come back. Okay, so we're now ready to install the new cooler. So that's all being cleaned off now. So what I'll do first of all is I'll take the new case slash cooler thing and take it apart so we can rest the Lati Panda inside it. So we're not moving the Lati Panda around much while we're fitting the top of the heatsink. It's going to be a little bit fiddly because I haven't fit that copper shim, but hopefully it'll be fine. I'm going to do this live for the first time on camera, so I might not do everything perfectly, but it'll be good to see just sort of my first impressions of how it all works, rather than me practicing those beforehand. Cool, so that comes out. And now that is the bottom of the case. So the Lati Panda will need to sit inside this, or on top of that anyway, like that there. And then this piece will sit down on top, that way there. And it'll all sandwich through like that and that'll work. So we'll take the top off. Leave the Lati Panda there. The first thing we need to do is we need to fit, put thermal compound on the CPU, then install the copper shim. So, I'll get the copper shim out here so we're ready. There we go, that's it's there. So we've got the thermal paste. Now what we'll need to do is something that's, I mean people are going to complain about this, let's face it, it's thermal paste, everyone loves complaining about it. Um, we're going to have to manually spread this out because it's a bare die CPU. So on modern CPUs, 
you've got the integrated heat spreader, so you don't really have that issue because the heat spreader spreads the heat out from the CPU. Oh, that's weird. Try and get some excess out of that. It's not coming out right. Um, there we go. Yeah, so in a modern CPU, you've got an integrated heat spreader, and that spreads the heat from the bare die out. So you can just put a blob on and let the force of the heat sink spread the thermal paste out. And then because it's spread out on that integrated heat spreader anyway, if you've missed a bit of the heat spreader, you're fine. It'll still spread elsewhere. On this, because you've got a bare die, you can't really rely on that. Because if you miss a bit of the die with thermal paste, the heat from that part of the die just won't transfer through, which means you could have potentially one core that runs too hot or the GPU could run too hot, and it, that could cause all manner of instability. So I put thermal paste on there, and I was very carefully spread it out with a bit of card just to get it reasonably covering the CPU. Well, this thermal paste is not quite right. This is like, hmm. Yeah, this isn't really that, it's not really spreading that well, it's quite thick. Doesn't seem quite right, actually, that thermal paste. Right, I'm going to go and try my own stuff rather than this stuff, um, and see if that works any better. Right, so I'm using Arctic MX4 now, see if this works any better than that stuff, because that stuff just didn't seem to spread right. That's a better consistency, I think. And now we'll try and spread that again, hopefully. This time it'll work better. Try a new bit card. Oh, that's a lot better, yeah. So that, that included the thermal paste did not spread properly at all. It was really, really sticky. This stuff is spreading out a lot better. So maybe bear that in mind. The include thermal paste might not be that good. Okay, we'll just get that. Roughly spread over the entire CPU die area, just so we're not missing any parts of it. Just a thin layer there. With this sort of thing, you want more than... You want to have too much, not too little. If you have too little, you really run the risk of like overheating parts of the die. This takes me back to like the early days of not having heat, um, heat spreaders on CPUs. Okay, there you go. Cool, so that's there. What we'll now do is put the copper shim on. So the copper shim can now go over that CPU there. And we'll just position that to the middle and push it down. Now bear in mind the CPU isn't super high power, it's not like it's anything ridiculous, but I want to give it the best chance of working. So now that's there, we now need to put more thermal paste on top of the shim. With this I suppose you could probably do a blob because it is essentially a heat spreader now. So I'll maybe just trust that with a blob, or I'll, I'll spread it out just to be safe. Um, yeah, just to be totally safe because I'm not quite sure about this. So here, yeah, I'll spread a thin layer over there. Making sure we don't knock that off the CPU. That'd be very unfortunate. Okay, so I've now spread the thermal paste out over that copper, the copper shim. If I was doing this again, I would probably not do not spread it out, just because moving, like, doing the motion to spread it was causing the plate to move around a little bit. So I'd have probably actually just tried it, just putting a dot in the middle and hoping the heat sink would spread it. But that's it there. So you definitely need to spread it on the CPU because it's an exposed die. You might not really need to do it with copper. But anyway, that's now installed, so now all we need to do is install the top. So make sure we get it the right way around. And then it's just going to be a case of putting that down as level as possible like that, squeezing it and making sure we don't lift off because of the thermal paste, and then turn it over and put those four screws through. And obviously we want this to be reasonably tight because we're this is also the clamping pressure on that CPU for the heatsink. Unlike a heatsink, I'll do it in a cross pattern just to be safe. So that probably wasn't the neatest application ever, so if I do have any thermal issues, I'll take it apart and try it again. And also it's usually a lot easier doing this when you're not under the pressure of filming it. So I'm fully expecting a lot of hate comments about, oh, I've done the thermal paste wrong, oh no, do it this way. It doesn't really matter. I mean, this is a really low-powered low CPU, it's a Core M3, so it's not exactly the most hot-running CPU ever. So, that's it there. A little bit of heat thermal paste on the heat sink, clean that off, there we go. And now, that's installed, so we've now got the Lati Panda in its case. And this feels really, really nice, feels really solid. It's 
you know, you've still got access to all the Arduino and GPIO pins, which is really good. You've got all your USB ports there, and you've got all your I.O. here. And I have just realised I've been a total idiot and forgotten to put the SSD in. Damn it. Right, so I'll need to do that and take it apart with the SSD in. Oops. But yeah, so you've not got access to your SSD slots annoyingly, but all the other I.O., including things like the like video output and the camera header and, all, and the um, micro SD slot and all that sort of stuff, is fully accessible from the sides. So yeah, I'm going to pop this open and put that SSD in because I'm an idiot and forgot it. But yeah, that is... feels really nicely made, feels really durable. So there we go, that's the SSD now reinstalled, so you can see it's sort of sitting in there. So what we'll now do is we'll install the fan. Now, this in theory apparently can run without the fan, you can use it just fully passively cooled. So I'll try that as well. Um, I'll install the fan on video just to show how you install it. And then when I do the testing, I'll try it with the fan and without the fan. And when I do it without the fan, I'll actually physically remove the fan just so it's not obstructing airflow across the heatsink. So we've got the fan here. Um, suppose I want to blow air into the heatsink because that's like a PC heatsink, the fan blows air down onto it. So I'll try that. So we need to position that that way so the cable can reach over to the port. That's what good to the included fan though, it is actually the right length of cable, which is good. So we'll plug that in there and then we need to screw it in. So there's some slight dimples you might be able to make out in the heatsink. There, sort of at the top of the finger. These are sort of aligned with slight notches out the metal to make the screw go in easier. So we'll try and line the screws up with that. The fan includes the four screws here as well. So let's try and line that up roughly there. There we go. And screw that down. There you go. That takes a little bit of down, downwards force and it doesn't seem to go in that strongly, so like the screw doesn't stop turning. So I'm just going to stop turning that myself because I don't want to like chew the screw hole out. Put these in. But it feels very, fairly strong when it's on there. It's not a heavy fan or anything. There we go. And that's, yeah, that's strongly on there, so that's fine. So what I'll now do is go away and test this. So I'll go and test it out with the fan on it, as well as, as, well as the fan off, and I've got results from the old fan as well. And we'll come back with the performance results. But yeah, it looks really nice. It feels really solidly built. I definitely trust this a lot more in terms of handling it and throwing it about than I did with the original cooler and the exposed PCB. So I'll be really interested to see how this performs. So let's go away and test it and I'll come back soon. Okay, so I've now carried out some performance tests so we can see how well this performs. And I'm really impressed with the performance. So we'll take a look at the results now. What I did for all these results is I recorded the temperature of the core, of each core and the package. And I did it when I was using the original cooling solution, the new cooling solution with the fan installed, and the new cooling solution with the fan removed. And I did tests at both idle, just sitting at the Windows desktop with no applications running and not even connected to the network. And then I did load tests running Prime95 to run a full CPU stress test on both cores. What I then did with each test is I recorded the room temperature and I then adjusted them all. So the room temperatures were all within about one degree of each other. But what I did is I then adjusted all the temperatures that I recorded to effectively bring the room temperature being in line with being a constant 20 degrees. So we, the room temperature shouldn't be able to affect the results here. So what we'll do is we'll look at the package temperature for all these tests. First of all, we'll look at the idle tests. So as you can see, on the original cooling solution, it idled at 48.4 degrees, and after fitting the new solution, with the fan installed on the heatsink, it idled at 36 degrees, and with the fan removed, it idled at 38.73 degrees. Now, those results of the new case, I would treat as just margin of error, because the fan only kicks in at 70 degrees. So having the fan on there versus not having the fan on there at idle doesn't really make a difference because the fan doesn't actually run. But you can see there that at idle, it runs a lot cooler with this new case installed than it did with the original cooling solution. So now let's take a look at the load temperature. So this was a full Prime95 stress test on both cores, maxing them out to 100%. And on the original cooling solution, that got to about 63.88 degrees. And it sat roughly around about that fairly constantly. Now, for the new cooling solution with the fan installed, I recorded this on the graph as 65 degrees because that's roughly in the middle, but this fluctuated a lot. 
what was happening with this, with the new fa with the new case with the fan installed, is it would heat up to about 70 degrees, the fan would then kick on and the temperature would rapidly decrease until it got to about 60 degrees, the fan would then switch off and it would slowly start to heat up to 70 degrees again, and it would keep doing that. Now that's the standard fan curve of the Lati Panda, that's what it does. I think on the original cooling solution, because it's got quite a small heat sink on it, it was never really able to drop it down to that 60 degrees mark to switch the fan off, so it constantly sat around that 64 degree mark with the fan constantly running. Whereas this new solution, because it's a much larger heat sink with a larger fan that moves more air, it would cause that fluctuation effect where it would get up to 70 degrees, fan would kick on, it would pull the heat right away, get it right nice and cool again until it hits 60 degrees and the fan would turn off. So I've put 65 degrees on the graph, but it's a bit different. It's not really a 65 degrees, it's more a much over a wider range, it's fluctuating a lot more. So that's what it was doing there. That seems pretty fine though, it does mean you're fluctuating in temperature, but it did mean it kept it fairly cool, it kept it, I'd say probably roughly in line with the, with the default cooling solution really. You know, it sits around the same point on average. What I then did is I took the fan completely off, physically removed it as well, and ran it at full load without any sort of fan on it. And at that point we hit 80.2 degrees. So that got pretty hot, and during that test, the Lahi Panda was actually too hot to touch. Like, fit, touching it was physically painful. It was really hot. But at 80 degrees, it's hot. But it's still well under the TJ Maxx temperature of that CPU of 100 degrees. So it's still pretty safe to run it like that. I wouldn't run it fanless if I was using this for heavy computations, constantly maxing out the cores. But you could totally run this in a fanless setting where you're not maxing out the cores. Maybe you've got quite a bursty load or it sits at idle most of the time. Running this fanless is a totally good option. So yeah, that was the main test results. As a very quick final graph I'll show, I've just shown the results of each core. Now so this is the results of each core combined for each of the tests. All this really shows is that both cores are running about the same temperature. Because this doesn't have a built-in heat spreader and I fitted that um, copper plate and manually applied thermal paste, it would be very possible to have thermal paste slightly aligned on one core and missing on the other core and have one core heat up more than the other. So all this results show us here is just that both cores are running at roughly the same temperatures, so the heat sinks installed correctly. If you're using one of these, it's worth checking that and check both cores run at the same temperature, because if one core is way hotter than the other one, it may indicate that you've not installed the heat sink correctly or the thermal paste is a bit misaligned. But this test just shows that the heat sink is installed correctly. During these tests, I also measured the CPU clock speed, and with both cores maxed out at 100% on all the full load tests, it clocked in at 1.796 gigahertz. So that's totally fine. It's not the full turbo boost frequency, but it is well above the base clock, so it is still turbo boosting. And that was the same clock speed for all the cooling solutions. So it's not getting you a much higher clock speed at all, but it's definitely, you're not thermal throttling with this new heatsink on it. It's running at the same speed as it always did. So that's a good sign as well. So there you go. That's a look at the LP2 armor case for the Lati Panda Alpha. And I really like this case. It feels really nice and durable, Definitely a lot nicer than having the bare board. And being able to, just having a built in better cooling solution seems really good. And then being able to just cool the Lati Panda passively like this as well for certain workloads that aren't hugely compute intensive is also a really nice bonus. So I really like this case. The only downside I can really see is the thermal paste it came with just didn't spread properly. Now, this could have sat in a box for a year, so I don't know. It's probably sitting in some Amazon warehouse and freezing temperatures or whatever. So this could have just gone off, it could just be a bit dodgy. So, I would obviously try the thermal paste it comes with, I'm not a snob, of ther snob for thermal paste, this stuff's probably absolutely fine if it worked, but it just didn't spread properly. So if you're getting one of these cases, I would maybe expect to have your own on hand, just in case you need it, because this stuff spread out a lot better than the stuff it came with. So that's the only real downside, is yeah, the included thermal paste just didn't really spread manually. I might try this on an actual CPU where the heat sink can spread it out, because I'm sure it'll be fine in that setting. But when you've got a bare die, I much rather spread it out manually, and this just wouldn't really do that as you saw in the video. But that's the only real downside. I mean, it's not hard to get your own thermal paste, and most people have it sitting around anyway if they're buying something like this. So, yeah, definitely a really nice case. So, I definitely recommend this, and if you're interested in buying it, there's links in the video description. Thanks for watching.